been Janet Klein, the um, secretary for the Friends of the Gibson Museum and um, Cultural Center. Janet is also a member of the board of the South Lake County Historical Association. Okay, Linda, uh, Nina, Nina, would you like to have a seat? You and Carl. There's a seat over there, Carl. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one also. So we are thrilled to have with us the graphic designer for the Gibson Museum, uh, Ms. Nina Busca, and her husband, Carl, who just had a seat. Nina has done many of the graphics for our museum, and we are thrilled that she's come over the mountain to be with us today. <laughs> All the way over the mountain. Yes. <laughs> the and, other and side she, of the mountain. And, <laughs> and she did it. Uh, she's also the author of the Stonehouse Museum, or the Stonehouse Museum's Little Book. Little Book, yes. So um, Nina writes uh, weekly for the um, Middletown Mercury News. And she used to write for the Time Star. She writes for a number of organizations. And so uh, we are thrilled, again, that she is here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. In addition to this being our first fireside chat of 2018, we have already scheduled our fireside chats for our coming fireside chats, or Kathleen um, Scavoni. She's going to be with us on March 10th. She is a writer and a longtime educator of a, in the Middletown area. Also on April 14th, Casey Patrick, who is an author and also, oh, there she is. And she is a new designer of uh, displays. And she is also the manager here for the Gibson Museum and Cultural Center, working for the County of Lake. So we are. Truly excited to have Casey here, as she also schedules uh, special tours, and um, she, yes? Okay, go ahead, Casey. <laughs> we have a really gift I'm introducing today, the Lily Langtree Chair. Um, Diane here purchased it from hospice, quite out of the blues, oh. and said, I recognize that chair. That's a Lily Langtree chair. And it needs to be preserved. And so she brought it over here. And donated it. And, ju and donated it. Okay. And just last, this last week, I was able to verify from photos in a book about Gwinnock Branch, it truly is a Lily Langtree chair. And it was pictured in the Gwinnock Branch when Sometime after she and her lover sat in them drinking wine, Clara. <laughs> anyway, we introduce you to our newest uh, acquisition. A acquisition, yes. Thank you, Clara. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy that you're going to take care of it. Yes. Yes. So, if you are interested in supporting this wonderful, intimate museum. You're invited to become one of our uh, Friends of the Gibson, which is $15 if you're single, and if you're a couple, it's $20 a year. Um, the Gibson has taken the time to become a partner with the Lake County Historical Society in this spring issue of the Canocti Chronicles. So there are about four or five pages about the Gibson Museum here in the Canocti Chronicles, and we have copies of that for you. Uh, just to let you know that uh, a week from Sunday, we're having a presentation over at the Lakeport Museum, or it's the County Courthouse Museum, and it is Maria Raphael, who is our County Museum Registrar. She's going to be our speaker. It's a free event, 1.30 at the Courthouse Museum, Courthouse Square in Lakeport. So those are our announcements. and. Who you have been waiting for is Mr. Galen Palmer. <laughs> Galen is the uh, librarian here in Middletown. And this used to be Galen's old stomping ground when it was the Middletown Library. 
So we change it up a bit since uh, Galen was here as the librarian. And, and he's moved across the way to a beautiful new library facility. And hopefully you've all been over there as well. But we welcome him home to uh, share with us. And also hoping that you get a chance to see our current exhibit, Bygone Books. All right, Galen Palmer. Yay! as being uh, the way we were. <laughs> so I've been thinking about how, how do I talk about how we were. Um, one of my first memories of moving to Middletown, because we came from San Francisco, was when I wanted to call my cousin to see if he wanted to come over or if I could go over there. <clears throat> I had to go to the telephone table and on the telephone table was a little oak box with a crank. And you crank that, mm -hmm. and down in town, across from the <laughs> laundromat, is this little building that I'm not sure what it is now. I think it's a pair of signs salon or something. Mm -hmm. That was the telephone building. And Ida Rannells was the telephone operator. And you crank the little crank and she'd come on a number please and you'd give her the number my cousin's number was 24J <laughs> and she would connect us and our number was 1Y21 and when I was working for a man up in Oregon one day he just off the cuff says do you remember what your number was your phone number was when you were a child and I said, well, of course I do. Why? But do you want the number before rotary telephones or after? And he looked at me like I'd lost my mind. <laughs> what do you mean, before rotary telephones? And I said, we, and I told him about the little crank box. And you're kidding. In our lifetime, you still had a crank telephone? Or, uh, yes. And I said, in fact, my mother, who was still alive at that time, my mother still has the phone number that we got after they put in rotary telephones. She's had it for nearly 60 years. He was amazed. Then when I left Middletown and went to into the service, I was in the Coast Guard. I was stationed on a an island in the middle of New York Harbor. We had this, we bought a brand new, in 1971, controlled data computer that was state of the art. Took up three rooms that had to be temperature controlled. Mm -hmm. And then when we computerized here, this was our little public computer area. Two computers, one there, one there. And they were the ones with the little towers and monitors. Now we've moved over there and we've got a whole bank of computers. But all of this technology comes together in this little device right here. <laughs> it's all in my pocket now. <laughs> this is probably more phone than I need, but <laughs> um, when we first moved here, <laughs> I remember telling, and Miss, Mrs. Pearson was very well aware of this, because she was our neighbor just down the street, and I used to go to her house all the time. And people would ask me about going to school in the fall. And I said, oh no, we're, we're just here for the summer. We're moving back to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, boy, did I learn. <laughs> but Mrs. Pearson was my first grade teacher. And she was a very unique individual. And she knew a lot of the history of this area. And she used to, as I understood it, 
when she was a young girl, she had gone with her sister, Abby, and they went to some kind of girls' academy, and they were trained to be rural school teachers. She was not a certified California school teacher. She was sort of grandmothered in, and they let her teach, and she um, retired not long after we got, and then she took over being a substitute teacher. When somebody was sick, she'd come in and watch the classes. But she, I was telling Nina this story, that when I was in first grade, she took a group of us children out Dry Creek for an overnight camping trip. And she, it was just her and us kids. And it wasn't, I don't remember the number of us kids, but it was, couldn't have been too terribly many. But as she was getting dinner ready in the campfire for hot dogs and <laughs> marshmallows, she told us, I'm gonna let you go and just wander out in the woods and every once in a while I'll yell, don't get out of the sound of my voice. And we all did that. And she finally called us back and said, dinner's ready. And we're getting ready to sit down. But one of the boys came back and he was just all excited. And he was saying, I found a spider web with a spider and I smashed it. Oh. And Mrs. Pearson said, you aren't eating <laughs> right away. <laughs> She gave us this lecture about spiders and how they're part of God's plan and this is what they do and this is why they're beneficial and on and on and on. And to this day, I will not harm a spider. <laughs> I will catch it and put it outside before I'll kill it. <laughs> I mean, she made a real impression on me. I don't know about the other children, but boy, she made one on me. And. Out where I live, I live out, I don't know how many of you know where Davies Dam is, but I live out by Davies Dam. And there were two houses just down from us and a dirt road that did a circle around them. And my dad, with his business, had an old international pickup truck that he would let me get in and drive. And I'm like 10, 11 years old, could barely reach the pedals, could barely look over the <laughs> steering wheel, and I'm driving down, just driving along, having a good time, and all of a sudden, there's a face in the <laughs> driver's window, and the door flies open. That was my introduction to a lady named Ski Heyman. She and her husband had been down swimming at Davies Dam. All she could see was this truck mm -hmm. moving by itself with oh. no <laughs> behind the wheel. She swam across that creek, came up that bank, and she was going to save that truck, and all of a sudden, here's this little face smiling up at her. <laughs> and that started a very long friendship with Ski and Huck, and also started me on my relationship with the Gibson Library because she would come here and do the yard work on a volunteer basis. She had issues with scar tissue in her stomach from various operations, and she could not bend down or shovel or anything like this. So when she needed help that was um, manual labor, she always asked me to come and help her out. And that was when I was in high school. And that started, and the, the library was not open at that time except with volunteers from the Native Daughters. And it was very sporadic because the ladies had other commitments. And the library was not um, that well equipped at that time until the county took it over in 1972, I believe it is. Um, while I was growing up, my folks owned what is now the clover plant. 
that Jim and Hetty Hedrickson had. And I think they're still involved, but I'm not positive. But because of that, at that time in Lake County, it was a resort community. And Cobb Mountain and all around the lake was mainly a summer vacation spot. And people would come up here and spend weeks at a time. And my folks owned, like I say, owned what was called Palmer Brothers. We delivered milk, ice cream, eggs, all kinds of dairy products to resorts, stores, restaurants. And when this was in operation, we were busy, really, really busy during the summer, but that's where my folks' income for the winter came from, was we had to work really hard during the summer and then stretch it out through the winter. But the library has this book about the resorts of Lake County. It is really very interesting. And I remember a lot of <laughs> the resorts that are mentioned in here, because they were all in operation. And it was a really interesting time to grow up in Middletown, because you met people from all over the country who would come here for vacation. And I still carry the work ethic that my folks gave me. And I know this, and I, I drive Christopher, my boss, crazy a little bit because I'm willing to come in at times when I don't have to, but no, we need to cover the whatever it is. And that's and when I was in school, I knew this young lady who was a in the class behind me. Her name was Jane Castle. She lived up on Cobb Mountain. As you're going to Cobb School, on the left-hand side, there's a road that goes down into like a Cobb Estates or something like that. She lived in the house right where you turn to go <coughs> to Cobb Estates. She, <coughs> one of, the, of America's favorite romance writers. She writes under the name of Jane Ann Krentz and Amanda Quick. <coughs> That's her. <laughs> and I'm glad to say I knew her. <laughs> and that area resorts map, if I'm not mistaken, is that's a reproduction of the one that used to stand over here where the Adventist Health Clinic is now. It, stood, it was there for most of my life, or most of my growing up life, and it was taken down probably while I was in the service. And I don't know whether it happened, whether they just threw it away or whether it's stored someplace. Who knows? <laughs> um, where do I go from here? <laughs> yes? Did you mention that uh, when you were 12 and driving that truck <coughs> and that there was a dam and a swimming hole? Where was that? It's about three and a half miles out 175. Oh. The dam is still there. Yeah. And people, well, people, before the Valley Fire, people used to go down there and swim. One of the houses that was there has now been replaced, and the man who lives there is very territorial mm. <laughs> and chases everybody out. 
that that dam, when I was, it was put in in 1956, if I remember correctly, and it was put in as an irrigation dam to water the field where the sewer ponds and the sprinkler system is. Is that on a creek? Yes. What's the name of the creek? Poudre Creek. Oh, it's yeah, on Poudre Creek. Yes. Oh. And there were a series of dams along there, even going up to Anderson Springs, yes. that provided electricity for right. Middletown. Right. That um, happened at the mill stump. There was no mill stump. No just mill stump. As you yes. go through the S curves. Right. So there were about four or five dams, according to John Parker, that were yes. part of our electrical system. Yes. Galen, how old is the community to Middletown itself? In years or when did it? When did that it get I'm not. That I'm not sure. <laughs> The late 1800s? Yes. Yes. No, 1871. Okay. <laughs> but when they put that dam in, it was to water that field, which was planted with alfalfa, for the Black Angus cattle that Dave Diamond D. Ranch had. And <clears throat> we kids always anticipated. When are they going to put, because the dam is sort of in a U shape, and they would come in with these I bars and put them in, and then they would put redwood boards against that, and then put visqueen on the back of that to keep the water, and there was a spillway that was off to the right-hand side. They had a revolving electrified wheel to keep the fish from going down the irrigation canal. But us kids waited for them to put that dam together so we should go and go swimming. And we had, a, we had a lot of fun. I spent most of my summers in that creek. <laughs> There's some more hands up front. Other questions? I don't know. I think we have to find more so about power, the electricity being generated. Um, but were those dams also built for any kind of mailing at first? Because um, I, I had heard that they also milled wheat or something to that effect. Boris? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I think it was. Uh, that's why they called it the millstone. Because right. I understand it, that they did. Yeah, because it, it, it was a grist mill for. Mm -hmm. oh, so it wasn't originally built for the electric then? That no. Was, okay. Combo. Mm. Yes. Is the, is the main town section that we see every day on Calistoga Road, does it look pretty much the same things when your parents were in business with the dairy? It certainly does. It does. Mm -hmm. it's, it, 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 businesses have changed. But most of the buildings have the same look that they did. So the buildings are about 150 years old. Yes. Okay. And as part of um, out south of town, out by <coughs> the Lazy S Mobile Park, mm -hmm. there's a, an antique store. Mm -hmm. That was a place called Mirabelle Springs, which was a restaurant and lounge. Yes. And a bar. Yes. A lounge. Lounge. <laughs> <laughs> and just right about where the millstone was, if you look, if you're going towards Cobb, if you look off to the left hand side, you can see something that looks like a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. What that was is out at Mirabel and where Tim Weber, who runs Perry's Deli, where he lives, when we first moved to town, <coughs> where Tim lives, there were three large cement ponds. And either at Mirabel or on Tim's property, 
you could pull in, you could rent a fishing pole, and there were fish in those ponds. And Mirabelle had one. The only thing was, it was in the ground, had a, an island in the middle of it with a bridge. And you could go across the bridge and sit and fish in this. And that, that was part of my growing up was, and I also remember that before Monticello Dam went in, my dad and I used to go down to Poudre Creek, which runs right by my house, and fish for steelhead. Because that was the, that's the only entryway from the bay up into this watershed. And they put a dam on it, and now the fish can't. Yep. So what motivated you to become a librarian? Oh boy. <laughs> Serendipity. <laughs> um, after I got out of the service, I went to Monterey, California, and was going to school at Monterey Peninsula College. And I realized that my VA benefits weren't going to cover all my expenses. So I went to the <coughs> college commons and looked on the bulletin board, and they had a job opening there for a shelver at the Pacific Grove Public Library. I went in. I got hired. I worked there for four years. Then I. At the same time, I left school, got a job at the Naval Postgraduate School bookstore. So I was working two jobs. So all my working life, I've been working around books. I got through the postgraduate school. There was a job opening at a community college up in Oregon. I applied, I moved to Oregon and ran that bookstore for three years. There was a little used bookstore that came up for sale, so I bought that, left the job at the college, ran the used bookstore for 11 years, and after my mom passed away, I came back here and I gave myself a six-month vacation and one Tuesday afternoon, because the library was only open on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. And I came in on a Tuesday afternoon, I said, I need to get myself a library card. And I walked through the door, and I got, I'm showing out the paperwork for a library card, and the lady behind the desk is saying, I only have two more days left to work here. We don't have qualified people for the job. And we don't know what we're going to do. So as I hand her that paperwork, I said, do I understand you have a job opening? And she said, yes. Well, can I have an application? And I took the application. About 10 days later, I had an interview with Kathy Chanson, who was the county librarian. About 10 days after that, I went to work. And I've been with the library since October 18, 1994. Yes. So it's hard to imagine this as a library because I never saw it as a library. And, uh, but so, what's your best guess? How many volumes they had in here? It was fifty-five hundred when we moved from here over there, and when we computerized the library itself, because these public access computers were provided to us by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And about a year after that is when the library contracted with Sonoma County to carry our inventory in their database. They took us over to Santa Rosa. We spent three days in training. I started in June. 
I went around the walls <laughs> and down the center. I categorized, I entered every volume of those by myself in that database. I was supposed to have help, but it didn't happen. <laughs> I had it done about two weeks ahead of time. From two the, weeks? No, about two weeks from our scheduled, oh. I think it was, no, it was, it was supposed to be done by September 30th, and I was about two weeks ahead of that, that I was done. And it was, it was a large job. <laughs> But this room behind me here was just an empty room that was used by various groups for meetings. Mm -hmm. When we got these, because this little area here was children's books. Yeah. And when we got the computers, we had to find some place to put them. So we decided we were going to put them here. So we turned that room into the children's room. Yes? Would you tell us a little of the history of this building? It was built in 1930 by a man named Chauncey Gibson, who was a, they call him a philanthropist from Oakland, but he owned, up on Socrates Mine Road, there was a resort called Castle Rock Resort. And his son, used to like to come up to Middletown and work at the resort. Um, his son passed away. The library is supposed to be named after the son, but it got named after Chauncey. But Chauncey offered the library to the town. He paid for the building. The townspeople raised the money to buy the land. And it was completed in 1930. He built two other libraries, one in Montclair, down like it, which is part of the Oakland system. He built another library that is on Edwards Avenue, if I remember correctly. And he also built a children's home for orphan children. Now, when I was probably, by the time I was driving that truck, <laughs> my cousin, the, <clears throat> I don't know who the land was purchased, or who the, who Chauncey got rid of that resort to. But when I was growing up, a couple by the name of Chris and Jenny Stevens owned that property, and they were trying to turn it into a hunting camp for people from the Bay Area. Turned out it was more expensive than they expected, but my cousin, Suzanne, met their son, George, and my cousin, Lauren, and I used to go up with Suzanne and George and Chris and Jenny and spend weekends at the resort. There was this big indoor swimming pool that was left from the resort that was heated by natural water coming out of the ground. And we swam in that pool. <laughs> and then, because it was so expensive for Chris and Jenny, they sold the property to Tom McKinley, who is no relation to the McKinleys <coughs> of the McKinley Drive that I live on. They're, well, they may be distant cousins or something, but. And that's why, and I think that's why when they were rebuilding the old Middletown Elementary School, the man who rebuilt it kept asking me about the McKinley School, the McKinley School, but it wasn't the McKinley School, it was the Middletown Elementary School. And it became, because it became connected with the McKinley name when Tom McKinley bought it, that's part of the history that needs to be cleared up. And then Hap was on the school board also yes. uh, in Middletown. Yes. <clears throat> and they called it Camp Vernon Vales? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. On Socrates Mine Road. Right. And it's now a rehabilitation facility. Well, until it, until it burned down. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know whether they're going to rebuild it or not. I have not heard. Uh, 
There was used to be a building called McKinley on Highway 175 on the right hand side of the road, which burned, and it's now replaced by the red and white building. Where you're no. next. <coughs> That's what I'm talking Does about. Does that have anything to do with what you're saying? Yes. Yes. The, right. the red building is what used to be right. the Middletown Elementary School. But it has no connection to the McKinleys yeah, other exactly. than the McKinleys bought it. Didn't they buy it? Buy it, yeah, bought it. Mm -hmm. So it was conquest, not relationship. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Different. What years was the Middletown Art Center building the school gymnasium? Do you know? It was still a gymnasium when we moved here, because I remember we went to a basketball, basketball game. Mm -hmm. But there was also a stage that was used for various for productions. productions of right. Theater. Yeah. So that would have been in the 50s? Yes. Thank you. And since you brought that up, um, we also, at that time, went into that Middletown Art Center building for the annual volunteer fireman's auction, which was a huge town event. The whole town turned out for it, and a it lot of- It was called the Pavilion, right? I think that, yeah, yeah. that's. And then, that was only for a couple of years. And then Al and Mary Cook, who owned J.C. Tyler Distributing, which is now Mount St. Anna Brewery, they opened up their warehouse for the annual fireman's auction until they raised enough money to build what is now B&G Tyler. Do you know if that building was ever the Pioneer Bakery? The pictures of the no. Pioneer Bakery look a lot like that building. You don't know. I don't think so. Okay. And Eileen Richmond said that she played for silent movies at that yes. building also. Uh, and when we moved here in 75, it was Jack Kinney's antique store. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Alan Johnson said in the 50s, he played basketball. Right. And that was the basketball court yes. and they played half court. It was only a half court right. in there. Had to go both ways. And it was a newspaper <laughs> office for a while, right? Yes. Yeah. Time yeah. Star. It was a Time Star. Uh -huh. And for a while it was a television radio repair. Are you still talking about the art center? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah the radio repair guy was a very gifted guitarist if I remember correctly. Married to a our lady whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, what I wanted to ask you was the, the um, building across the street from that beautiful Victorian, which is now Jazzercise, mm -hmm. that building had a marquee on it. And I know that the, the, the repair went in there at one point, but it is also the way the building was designed, I don't think it's designed the same way anymore. Um, had a stage, in other words, it was a flat floor with a stair with about a three foot rise in the back. Was it a movie theater? Was no. It, what, what was the marquee business about? It was a Baptist church. With a marquee? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, each of the marquee was a Baptist church. Okay. And then Clem Barcelo purchased it and used it for storage. On a video store. It was yeah, a video no, store. After, he passed, after he passed away, his son and daughter turned it into a video store. So Jazzercise has been a lot of things better. I understood it was a music store at one point, too. That's why there were piano yes. keys painted on the stage. Yes, it That's, was a music store one time. Mm -hmm. And, and um, also a repair shop and a yes. storage shop for uh, one armed bandits. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise known as slot machine. <laughs> and then uh, uh, when, uh, uh, what's his name, Magoon bought it, and he came, now I can't think of his name, I know. Orville. No. Thank, thank you, this is when I get old, okay? Um, no, Orville's brother. Oh, that's a 
Robert? Yes, Bob. Uh, Bob. When yes. Bob bought the building, I think the county forced him to take the marquee down because it was at that point separated from the building. And the mm -hmm. county was confirmed some child or some adult or whatever right. just walked underneath that. And we, have, of course, had the same experience in New Orleans, but that was a frequent occasion, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. yes. you, you have better zoning and, and, and usage <laughs> laws here than we did in Louisiana. We're a little flexible and so. I was, I was going to ask you, um, you were saying earlier that you and your dad used to um, deliver to the resorts. Mm -hmm. Was Harb where Harbin was recently? Mm -hmm. Well, it still is. Um, was that one of the resorts? Because yes. that was a resort, yes. right? Yes. Before. And when, when it changed and it became, you know, what it, what it has been, um, how much of an impact did it make in the, in the town? Because there was some initial... Uh, I did not live here at the time uh, okay. that that transition took place. Yeah, because it was quite. But some the folks, wasn't the <laughs> man that owned Harbin when I was growing up was a man named Newt Booth. Uh -huh. And I remember my dad, the town barber, Vince Taylor, and Newt decided they wanted to grow horseradish. So when you went out on the back of the building and looked way down, that's where we planted the horseradish. Mm. And Newt kept an eye on it and said, okay, I think it's ready to be harvested. So we go out there, we pull up the horseradish roots, start grinding it. We later discovered that <laughs> you don't grind horseradish in the open air. Horseradish factories have these like vacuum things so that the fumes don't get out of there because uh -huh. they, are, it, they are so, I guess, yeah, potent or toxic, whatever. Uh -huh. But we, could, all of us were just crying so bad that <laughs> we, could, we couldn't get near it. <laughs> Yes. As a relative newcomer, when I go out 29 past the casino, on the left there looks to be a kind of 60s-shaped sign that might have been a drive-in. Is there a drive-in? Rancho Lumber. Lumber? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Rancho Lumber. Mm -hmm. I wish I remember the name of the guy that owned it. Larry Marty? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Somebody else wants it now, or I don't know. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty much empty now. Yes. And this facility w was also used as a town meeting, and I remember twice coming in here and with Jane Castle competing in the Lions Club speaking contest and the Rebecca's and. Odd Pillows speaking contest. Yes. Who won? <laughs> Don't lie. Well, she and I didn't compete. I competed a different year than she did. Um, and Taylor is the one that won the year that I, and Jane is the one that won the year following year. And Jane is the one who got to go on the trip to New York City. <laughs> So in your moving from this facility to the one across the street, what are the greatest changes or differences? Besides more space. Well, there's certainly more room over there. <laughs> <laughs> and more light. Yeah, and more light. Um, more people. And it's that, when we were planning that library, Susan Clayton, who was the county librarian, we realized that once that facility opened, we were going to see an increase in usage. We were proved right 
when Christopher sends me the figures for monthly usage, we are about 3% away from the figures for the Clear Lake Library. Wow. We're doing it with two people. They're doing it with four. Wow. And it's, that's been one of the biggest changes, is there's a whole lot more work to be done. So are you accepting volunteers? I yes, oh yes, I've, I've got volunteers, and they're very reliable, and I don't want to lose them. <laughs> Would you like more? So if anyone at the, has at any the moment, no, because I have just right right now I have just about enough work to keep those volunteers busy. Good. If it picks up, yes, I do occasionally take on um, youngsters from the school that have community service hours they need to get rid of. And yes. Unless I missed it earlier, tell me again when you moved from this facility across the street, Kevin. 2013. Okay. And the Gibson Museum opened in May of 2014, wasn't it? Right. Yes. Yes, we, we, we started the day the music, the library moved. <laughs> we started working on the building. Martha Webster had been trying to get this to be a museum okay. for many years. And I'm, I'm glad that it has a new life as a museum, you have no, uh, no idea how many people used to come in to this library when I was working in it and say, I'd really like to have this for my house. Right. Yeah. No. I was, I was afraid another real estate business would move in. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, at that time, it was like real estate. Every other right. building was a big real estate boom, remember? Mm -hmm. Yes. And they were just mushrooming everywhere. I read that at one point a family was housed in the back to work as librarians here. Do you know what years that was and who they that, were? That would have been in the 40s. In the 40s. Okay. And it's, it's that little room that is behind your desk. We call it the archive room, right? Yes. Yeah. That was where they lived. Yes, that was Whoa. <laughs> cozy quarters. <laughs> but they they only stayed here the days that they were working. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. And when when I was doing the little speech thing, um, this room was a kitchen, right, with a sink yes. and a stove. Mm -hmm. When they would have in this room or this facility was used by the Lions Club for a long time as their meeting, oh. and the, the wives would come in and fix dinner, <clears throat> and feed the guys, and... Okay. And the Boy Scouts also met here, yes. because yes. Uh, Jim Comstock mentioned right. stoking the fire yep. to get it heated up for, the, for their meeting. And when we left, I thought, in the storage room on the back porch mm -hmm. were some Boy Scout signs that there were wooden yes 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 um do you recall any other catastrophic catastrophic fires in middletown other than the valley fire that recently came through yes 1964 my senior year in high school end of september early october was the hanley fire and it started up on St. Lena, came down, burned that ridge on the other side of the creek. Mm. They stopped it at the cemetery at Butts Canyon Road. Mm. The winds shifted, took it back up over St. Lena, down to Calistoga city limits. It also went across Tubbs Lane jumped 128 and burned the same area that was just burned in October of this last year. Going to Santa Rosa? Yes. 53, 53 years later, it all yeah. burned again. And then the 1918 fire that burned most of Middleton. Right. 
Now that fire you referred to, did it burn most of the buildings? And most everything built rebuilt after that, mm -hmm. of course. Well, it, the facades I think stayed uh, remain. We have some photos on this display uh, to our right, uh, and also the Methodist Church was one of the few buildings that survived that fire. It was built in 1897. The stone church there. The, the 1918 fire started in the livery across from the Lake County House, the hotel on the corner, and it burned most of the businesses in that area. Mm -hmm. It didn't yeah. get down this far. Mm -hmm. it, it burned that area up there, and several, quite a few homes on what we now call 175. Mm -hmm. And Nina, the, uh, the piece of furniture behind you, is not, isn't it reputed to have survived that fire in the Lake County house? But we don't know where in the fire yet. <laughs> that was a donation that was made uh, at that time to the Lower Lake Schoolhouse Museum from Dick and Mickey Griffin. And then uh, when we opened this museum, that county museum uh, transferred it here since it was part of the 1918 Fire. Yes. <clears throat> Earlier when you were speaking of the, the history of the whole area and you talked about um, the, uh, the resorts and so many people being here during the summertime and I was reading the little historical uh, piece that's written over here on, on the wall telling about some of that. Yeah. One of the things I was curious about it said, uh, it was telling about how Hoburg's was the only one that did not have springs. It was one who drew people here for entertainment and so forth, which I knew. And it said it closed in 73. And then below that, it talked about uh, that it was being uh, opened something other friends of Hoburg or something. And I wonder, if, was that written prior to the fire? Was that something that was planned prior to the fire? Or is that something that's currently planned? I know there was plans to turn that into some kind of, I think, Buddhist retreat. Well, at once it was Maharishi Mahi that, that, Yogi that, 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 with that, that, the um, heart, uh, not heart, heart, just the center, what's he called? Oh, 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 Transcendental, yeah, right. the TM Center right. <laughs> at that time. But most recently it was reopened. They had developed, uh, I think, four rooms to be rented there, and it was going to be revitalized and mm -hmm. everything. And unfortunately, there was supposed to be a membership club, was it not? And they had a giant event there. That, that's uh, what he's talking about there. So that's uh -huh. pre fire, though. Yes, it was pre fire. So they haven't updated that. That's yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know what? Well, we're actually, doing have Sandy, wood. have Sandy Hobart here. Oh, we can oh. ask her. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, 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 I keep hearing different plans from the fellow that's involved now. We, we stay in contact. And our, our old home that burned there, he's buying the land. And so I keep asking him what's going on. And they he keeps coming up with different ideas. They're talking about now putting in a subdivision with different home sites sort of like Hidden Valley as a membership place where they'll revitalize the pool and, you know, do different things. But, you know, I, I just yeah. don't know that, yeah, it, it's pretty pretty uh, empty up there right now. Mm -hmm. They're, they've even suspended the cleanup at this point. They're yeah, out of grant money, you know, so. Mm -hmm. hey, when the issue is money, it's, the financing is what the problem is. Always. It's every time you develop an idea, you won't stand up to whatever Also, when I was <clears throat> growing up, as you go out towards Lower Lake, there's the um, Hartman Bridge and Hartman Road. Yes. 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 What is now Hidden Valley was the Hartman <coughs> Ranch. And they sold it to Boise Cascade, who developed it into Hidden Valley. 
Well, it has truly been a pleasure having you with us, Thank you. Galen. Thank you. And going back through time <laughs> and having those of us who have been here part of that time contribute. It's been a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. We will be serving refreshments in...